Good. Okay, so good night, everyone, and I have missed us. We, we haven't been here for a while now, I know, but tonight we are bringing some really special figure to talk with you. So I'm just going to keep talking about him and then I'm going to bring him here and then you will, you know, you, can, you will be able to do some questions for him and then just join us in this lovely live stream that I was, oh my God, missing so much to do for you all. So uh, please welcome Les Brown, and he is a CARS hydrogeologist with 24 years of experience studying hydrology of live storms. He's a PhD studying inception and development of conducted and caves in Kilkar Karst, and has worked in Ireland, UK, and the Middle East, where there was this uh, lovely photograph of him on the mountain bike that I've just knew that, and this is a lovely photograph, by the way. <laughs> And so solving problems with groundwater and he's, he's a member of SUI since 1995. So it's a really amazing figure. I, I when I was trying to write about him um, and I was I was talking with Pity uh, and he, he was just saying that he was one um, one of the best technologists that ever appeared here. So please welcome him. And um, before I just pass the word for him and let him talk, because I'm not going to be talking here with you too much just in the end when I'm going to bring some questions to you all so we can have a quick chat uh, I would just would like to uh, thank you Paul to make this happen because you, you are really special for us as well and then um, just thank you for start sorting everything once again <laughs> and no making problem this at all. Uh, live stream um, you know possible <laughs> it's, it's, it's great to be here I, I enjoy doing it. It, it it's something to do on a, on a lonesome Thursday evening um, especially when it's far too warm to be outside for Ireland so May as well Jesus. just come back inside, even if it's <laughs> the height of summer. So, yeah, that's lovely. Okay, okay. So I'm just I'm just gonna let you talk. Les, thank you so much uh, for accepting the invite, and thank you so much for to do this lovely presentation. It's it's really it's really beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. I'll, I will stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Thank you very right. much. Thanks for the invite. And, no worries uh, at all. It's great to be doing something back for SUI, actually. And it's, uh, hopefully, folk will get a fair bit from this presentation. Um, quite often get asked questions when we're in the pub, when the pubs are open, about uh, the work I've been doing up here in Manor Cavern area. And a lot of questions about what kind of caves we can fort, what kind of caves we have in this area, how water moves through them and hints on perhaps where more caves, new caves can be found. So what I've done is I've pulled together a, a, a series of slides here um, just to give you an overview of cast hydrogeology principles thereof. I'll talk a bit about water tracing as well and a couple of case studies maybe. We'll see how time goes. And then at the end, I'm going to be talking a bit about some cool new projects that we've got on the go at the moment and some funding we've got to, to help support it and, and bring, bring the water tracing we have been doing in this area into the 21st century. So um, I'm hoping that at the end of this, we're going to get lots of people interested in doing a bit of water tracing with us. And I'll certainly be, be keen to get some assistance over the next year or two as we be carrying on doing some, some tracer tests in the Manor Cavern area. Speak a wee bit louder and move your mic a wee bit closer. There's a bit of background noise, so there is. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Absolute star. <laughs> we'll get it sorted. Hopefully that will stay there, and um, hopefully that's a bit clearer. Yeah, I'll have to do. Um, apologies about the bit of background hiss. There's there's nothing we can do about it. It's uh, we don't know what it is. It's fine. Well, it's yeah. It's this the, the heat wave we're currently having in Black Lion, and my laptop's just struggling, so the fans going nuts. Anyway, not not too common in instance. Anyway, yeah. So. I'm ready to start whenever, whenever 
you give me the heads up, and then we can we can get going. Yeah, you can go okay. ahead. Yeah. Right. So, I've decided this. Decide. Decide. I've, I've split this presentation into four different sections. Like I said, we'll talk about some of the principles of cast hydrogeology. And then I'm going to talk a bit about uh, water tracing techniques, how it's evolved over time and how we're doing it these days. Uh, I've got a case study, which is some of the water tracing we've been doing at Cascades Resurgence Cave in Fermanagh. And then at the very end, I'm going to bring in a bit of catchment care. And this is the project that SUI has got some funding for. And it's to do a lot of tracing in the Fermanagh Cavern area and using some quite nice new instruments that we have now taken receipt of. So I'll crack on and talk about principles about cast hydrogeology. Uh, as Camilla said, I'm a hydrogeologist and have been for, for a while now. Uh, my PhD was in cast and I've always been interested in hydrogeology, but, but cast in particular. And I suppose it's because really cast just doesn't really obey the usual laws in hydrogeology. It's often very complicated and from this, the picture on the screen here, um, it can be very contrasting in terms of water environments in this case, which is this is the East Caucasus. And you go to look at the viewpoint, but we have streams running off the mountain and as soon as they hit the limestone, they go underground and they can travel quite a long way. Long way. Traditionally in hydrogeology, you usually do your calculations based upon Darcy's law, but there's lots of assumptions and limitations to Darcy's law. First of all, Darcy's law is based upon flow being uniform, flow being laminar. And you can imagine that's what we get if you're dealing with flow in going through sands and gravels, that kind of thing. But as we all know from caving, cast is anything but that. And in terms of cast hydrogeology, we tend to think about the characteristics in, in three ways. So limestone typically has uh, what we call a triple permeability. And that is, it has a primary porosity, and this is how groundwater moves through the actual body of the limestone. So if you can imagine the grains that limestone is made up of, which are very small and cemented well together, that's your flow through there, and it's very slow. You also get flow called secondary flow, and this is secondary because it goes through fractures. It's wherever you get fractures occurring on the rock, and the flow is focused along those fractures, but it doesn't go anywhere else but the fractures. And then in cast, we have tertiary, which is the conduits, the caves, which we all know and love. And this causes real problems for traditional hydrogeology because if ever you're doing any calculations to determine how flow moves through a rock, well, Darcy flow calculations work really well if you're dealing with uh, sand and gravels or even a sandstone. But if you start dealing with triple permeability, it just can't handle it. And it can't handle it because when you get fracture flow and when you get conduits, flow moves much more faster. And in terms of conduits, it's more like flow in a river. It's very turbulent. And this breaks all the limitations and assumptions which you have in Darcy's law. So the way I like to think about cast flow is that when you're looking at the matrix in the limestone, the flow is really small, very small. But when you think about a limestone block, and if you take, for example, uh, the picture I've got on the screen there, and this is of the prods area, if you look at that area, the limestone that had that area the matrix flow is tiny, very small, but of that area, which is a couple of kilometers square, most of it is limestone. It's not fracture flow and it's not conduit flow. So although in that particular area, by volume, the flow is by matrix flow, the actual quantity of flow that can go through fractures and conduits is so much more. And this is the thing that really interests me about cast hydrogeology is because although you're looking at very large areas of limestone, all the measurable flow is going through fractures or conduits. And it really changes the dynamics of how groundwater flows. And quite often it has lots of challenges. 
over the last few decades, there have been lots of different models about how caves form. And um, on the screen here now, I've got a, some sc a screen grab from Gardner's work back in 1935, so 85 years ago now. And he was looking at how flow in limestone leads to the development of caves. Um, from memory, I think he was looking in the Mendip area. In fact, a lot of the early work was in the Mendips area of England. But he pulled together uh, a schematic showing how caves develop as groundwater flows through them. And he developed this model, valleys, pathways through the limestone to the valleys, forming springs and developing. And this is great because it shows several different kinds of flow. It shows the, the, the primary matrix flow to start with, where there's no preferential flow paths. It shows secondary flow occurring along fractures and along horizons and bedding planes. And then it shows conduits developing along those and getting bigger and bigger. So you get the whole progression of very little flow, flow rate increasing. And in the end, you're dealing with you know massive amounts of flow going through conduits. But our thoughts and ideas about how caves form has really advanced since then. If we go forward 71, and this is another example of, of how caves have been considered to be developed, and this is uh, quite a famous one by Ford from 71. Um, he was looking at how you get pathways occurring in bedding planes and fractures, and he developed this model of the different flow paths here. And again, he's considering the different types of flow paths. Eventually, he's ending up with a, a stream cave like we all know and love, but he's developed here a sequence about how that forms. So again, lots of different kinds of flow paths. Main flow paths in the conduits, higher up matrix flow. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of work considering how long it takes to form caves. And nowadays, we consider caves to form, or conduits to form, certainly long before the landscape. So we have a, a much greater understanding now about how caves form. And we have a much better understanding about how flow changes in limestone as caves develop. And it's this sequence again from slow flow in the matrix, slowly building up through fractures and bedding planes, fracture flow and then enlarging to become conduits and caves. And one of the critical things that these guys talked about was a change from laminar flow to turbulent flow. And this is hydrogeologists basically start to differ. Cast is not laminar flow, it's turbulent flow, and that's where we get the enlargement of caves and conduits and quickly. Um, Palmer from the US did quite a lot of work and he was trying to work out how recharge relates to cave shapes. And he pulled together this really nice summary table here, which I've used quite a lot. And if you've ever heard me talking in the pub about how the shapes of caves give you a bit of an indication about how that cave has developed and how that cave is recharged, this is the table I usually refer to. And it, it's pretty good because his study showed that the shapes of caves, for starters, they change depending on whether you're dealing with fractures or you're dealing with bedding planes. So that's the first part of the rows he has here. And you can see fracture, the caves forming along fractures are forming much more angular passages. Uh, bedding partings tend to form much more curved passages. Um, for those of you that are more familiar with the with cave surveys, say of cascades of marble arch, you'll notice that the upstream sections are very much so angular and these are formed along fractures. But when you get down towards the resurgence, they tend to be much more meandering. And that's because they're more bedding related. So this certainly fits with the models we're seeing in the Fermanagh cavern area. But it's interesting from the perspective of water flow again, and what I come on to dye tracing because the ends of these passages are obviously inlets, and this is where the water comes in as a point input from a surface stream. And this is where most of the Irish caves sit and form. If you look internationally, you'll start to see that caves 
don't just form branching networks like we have in Ireland and, and the UK. They tend to be quite a wide range and he's developed these different models for those different shapes. So these are from caves that have been enlarged from stream sinks, again, like the, the, the marble arches and the cascades of this world. But when you start getting different shapes, like these maze caves and even these quite crazy caves here, um, these are formed by different ways. They're not from stream sinking into the caves, they're from diffuse recharge coming in from the roof. So not individual stream sinks, but just very slow percolation water going through the rock. So you can tell an awful lot from the shape of the cave, how it formed, but also you can tell an awful lot from the cave in terms of how the dynamics of the cave is recharged and also how the cave is, is developing. So I might refer back to this later on, but this is a, a really good, I, I use this quite a lot. Okay, on to water tracing. A uh, picture on the screen is one that was taken by John Kelly. It's some of the work that he did down in County Clare with the uh, cavers down there a couple of years ago. And this is the, the usual, there's a spring here and you can see the, the fluorescein dye coming out. And they had a drone about for that one and got some really good snaps of this tracer coming out the ground. But overall about water tracing, um, I mean the objective, well, water tracing is used to determine a connection from the stream sink to resurgence. So we put dye in at the stream sink and we monitor at a range of resurgences. We see where the dye comes out. It's important to get as much information from that. So how much dye you put in, how long it took to get through and from that you can characterize it quite a bit. So you can advise from the from the velocity of the dye to get breakthrough, from the dilution, from the detection duration, you can tell an awful lot about how that water was moving through the conduit. Was that water being diluted with other water? Uh, did that water go into a big phreatic zone and sit there for a long time before coming out? Or was it, for example, uh, split and did you get different quantities of dye coming out of different springs? So you can tell an awful lot from dye detection, but historically the problem has been in that it depended on how many samples you took. So normally when you put the dye in, you'd be taking a water sample every day to see how much dye was coming out. And you might have to do this for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, or even longer. But nowadays we have uh, loggers that do this and we can get them programmed so that they take a, a sample every 15 minutes. So effectively we've gone from having a positive, negative result, whether that dye goes to the spring, to having a, a regular sample and determining exactly how much dye is becoming through. And it's a, a real advancement in, in tracer technology. On to the dye types. Mostly we use fluorescent dyes, um, rhodamine, fluorescein, optical brightening agent. Fluorescein is the, the most common one used pretty widely in Europe. I find it to be particularly good in Ireland because quite often when we have boggy waters sinking into caves, they, they can sometimes mask the, the rhodamine signature. So um, sometimes we've had a a detection at a spring which is very small and we weren't sure whether it was due to the organics in the water, the peaky organics in the water, or whether it was due to rhodamine. So in general we tend to use fluorescein the most. It always provides a very distinct peak and uh, it's the most photogenic as well. Um, you can also use, oh that says coloured pores, could be coloured spores. So basically we use those quite a lot as well, but that can be quite time consuming as well, collecting them and also natural traces. So quite often the water sinking will have a particular chemistry and you can detect it at the spring as well. But that's not so much used these days. Fluorescent dyes are what we've done here. Very important that when you're doing water tracing that you keep the environment protection agencies informed. So 
EPA in the Republic and NIEA in the North. Um, there are guidelines about what you can and what you can't do. The dyes that are used are non-hazardous, but the aim of the tracer test is so that you just put enough in to get a positive trace to spring, because when you have a visible result that potentially goes into a water course, you can uh, cause some temporary staining, so you can turn the riverbed a bit green or a bit red if you're using rhodamine, but also the fish life. So if you're using tracer tests, you've got to be very careful about how much you put in and you've got to aim for it coming out to give you a big enough spike so there's no question about it being a positive result. But when you start getting positives, then you tend to get a, a few complaints. And I always say that when you're doing the tracer tests, you should inform the environment agencies beforehand so that they are aware, so that they can give you any particular advice, any points. Um, but I think it's also very important to tell the local interested parties as well. Um, this includes the likes of fish farms, show caves. Um, if you're using tracers and there are fish farms in the area, you need to keep them informed so that if something does come through, they will contact you first rather than the environment agencies. It's much better for them to contact you than the environment agencies. But also show caves. Um, there's been a few times where we've had, for example, positive traces uh, coming through show caves when the show cave owner didn't know that was the tracing was going on and sort of flanks a few alarm bells. But also caving clubs, it's, it's great to basically get feedback if you do have a, a positive trace, if you if you do have a, a, a colour coming out of the spring, having getting that phone call to tell you it's happened and knowing the time that it came through at, you can actually get a lot of information and you can use that to characterise the springs and the flow as well. So I would generally say keep as many people involved as possible. When's the best time to take a tracer test? Um, I learned this the hard way. Um, I used to do tracer tests all year round, but in Fermanagh Cavern area and in Ireland in general, when you do get a long summer, it means that the tracer that you put into the ground can sit there for a long time before it pops out. And as I said before, in the past, we've done a lot of these manually where you take a water sample every day and you really want the test to last as short as possible. If it takes two or three months for the dye to come out, for starters, that's a huge time investment. But also, when the dye comes out, it's probably going to come out in such a low concentration that it's going to give you a very uncertain result. So tracer tests are best done in the autumn, the winter, and the spring. Summer is to be avoided. Sorry, just on the previous slide there, I had this is a this is simply a uh, rainfall record in the Fermanagh area since 2005. So we've got what's that? Eight years, nine years worth of water of, of rainfall data here. Um, there are very few areas, very few times where we don't have too much rainfall, but you can see how much more rainfall we tend to get especially in October, November and December, which tend to be the, the wettest months. So October, November, December are usually the best times to get tracer tests done. Um, the reason for this is two charts here. The one on the left is rainfall and the one on the right is recharge. And recharge is actually the water that would typically go underground. In the summertime, vegetation transpires and evaporation occurs and an awful lot of water is lost in the summer from rainfall straight back up into the air of the vegetation. To see that the recharge value is here that we do get an extended period. You might have rain occurring during these times, but it's not actually going to ground. It's all being transpired or it's all evaporating. And during these times, if you are need putting your dye into the ground, it potentially could sit there until the next flush comes through and washes it out. So, and as you'll see, the kick in recharge here, it usually occurs early in October, usually around about the symposium time, if I'm honest. 
and this is when most of the, the, the systems get flushed through. So by tracing, yeah, October, usually through to March or April is best. And this is just a plot to show how much evaporation and transpiration actually occurs in the summer. You get such a soil moist deficit that quite often um, any rain that lands on the surface will just be absorbed into the soil and it won't actually mobilize any water into the stream. And uh, from the looks of this, the uh, summer of 2010 is a good one. Another thing to consider is how your caves respond to flood pulses. Uh, this is a plot from some work I did in Kula River, which back in 2005, where we were seeing how the cave was responding to storm events. Um, in this particular case, there's a, obviously a, a blockage at the end of the cave, and the water level backs up hugely, um, in this case, by about maybe 30 meters. But if you understand how the caves in the area respond to flow, you get a much better idea of what kind of dye pulse you're going to get through. So, for example, if you look at Marble Arch, if you were to put dye in a cradle hole, that dye will be diluted by the large amount of water that's there, but it'll also be carried through one slug, so you'll get a very short duration of dye coming through. But if you're putting dye into, for example, pigeon pots, and you're detecting it at Cascades or Shannon, there's a lot more dilution that goes on, and the volume is a lot lower, so you'd be looking at a duration of flow. You'd be set springs effectively for a number of days. So it's always good to be mindful of that when you're preparing for your test. So you know, are you going to get a big slug through that's going to take, come through in a couple of hours? Or are you going to get high level of background coming out for a number of days? Then pretty much every cave will respond differently. OK, so. Looking back at the water tracing that's been done in the Fermanagh area, this is one of John Gunn's plots from the early 80s. Um, John Gunn started doing water tracing in the Fermanagh cavern area, late 70s, early 80s, and he really started the, the, the water tracing and the delineation of, of catchments in the area. And a lot of his work led to quite a few big discoveries as well. Um, Shannon Cave was found because of trace test results. Um, and quite a few others as well. But effectively, what he was doing was he was putting dye in individual springs. Or, yeah, I'll stop that again. He was putting dye in individual stream sinks across the mar bank, and he was placing detectors. And in those days, detectors were essentially activated charcoal, which were held together in nylon, so that basically water could flow through it. Um, and any dye that flowed through it was captured by the charcoal. So we'd leave them in for a week at a time or a couple of days at a time, depending on how often you were visiting. And then he'd take them away and he'd extract any dye from them and he'd have a, a positive or a negative result. Does that sink drink to, does that sink drink to the spring? Um, he then started doing water sampling on a, a daily basis, so he was getting higher resolution. But effectively, what he was doing was only really proving, um, he was proving positive results. Um, and it really comes down to hours spent sampling, how frequently do you sample. If you knew the cave systems really well, like he did, he would start taking perhaps water samples at a more frequent basis when he was expecting the dye to come out, just to give him a bit more resolution. But quite often, it would be sort of weekends only, or so it's, it's challenging. Um, so really good pioneering work, really good work, and he's still doing some fantastic work um, using bloggers. Um, but it was really John Gunn's work that kicked off the water tracing and the cast hydrogeology in, in this area. He was able to delineate the catchments based upon his water tracing results, so he was able to identify the delineation of the Tullyhona catchments, the prods, Cascade catchment, Marble Arch, and also a schoolhouse. And then he went on to do Shannon as well, and a few other caves around the eastern side of Kulka. So he really started the catchment delineation of the cast systems in the Manor area. I started working with John in the mid 90s, um, 
uh, learned an awful lot from him and I've continued doing the traces into the mid 90s. In terms of tracer tests, this is a copy of some traces that John and I were doing in the 90s, where we would have a program. In this case, we did 14 tracer tests across a two year period. And we would pick out our injection points, most of these across the East Coca area, because that's the, the area we were focusing on at the time. And we would put charcoal detectors at all of the risings around the Fermanagh, around the Coca Upland area. And as you can see, there was quite a lot. So we were putting detectors at you know, up to 20 or, or 22, 23 rings. And we were, we were sampling them all. And this is a summary of the results of those. So positive means we recovered dye from the charcoal detectors of water samples. Negative is that we didn't detect dye. So we were able to carry this out for a couple of years and start building a catchment map for this part of, of Coca Mountain. So an awful lot of work went into pulling this together. Um, it's, uh, it was very time consuming. The results of those are then pulled together and the analyses will give us information such as how long the water takes to get from sink to rising, which we refer to as average linear velocity, usually as a measurement of meters and hours. And it's linear because quite often we don't know which route the cave or the flow path takes between the sink and the resurgence. So assuming it's a straight line, in this case, the water is going at 77 meters per hour. We all know that caves do not go in straight lines, so this is the minimum velocity. And this is quite typical of the Fermanagh area where we have quite high velocities. For example, if we took take Polysumra there, we're getting a, an average linear velocity of, of 320 meters per hour the water going through the cave system between sink and resurgence. Now, in this case, we do actually know the route that the water takes because of the cave has been surveyed, and it is actually quite linear in this particular case, just following a factor, but that's particularly high. Other ones, we've got other ones that are up at 300 as well, and then a couple that are in the low 30s. Where we get those in the low 30s, it's usually because there's extended dumps or flooded sections. Um, this one in particular, the monster there, yeah, we all know that's got quite an extensive flooded section, 30, so it's 32 meters per hour. So in this particular case, even though there's more cave passage between Polysumera and Marble Arch than there is Monaster and Marble Arch, the water gets through from Polysumera much quicker. In fact, it gets through from Polysumera to, to Monaster to Marble Arch rising probably about 12 hours when the flow is quite high. Advancing from the average linear velocities and the, the gradients, the real aim of this work is to do catchment delineation. Which surface water streams go to which resurgences? Um, this is a product of some of the work that John and I were doing in the 90s, where we were able to delineate the catchment for Marble Arch, Cascades, Prods, Polyhona, and the Shannon there as well. So these are all the springs around the Marbank escarpment, and we were able to delineate them. And when you can delineate them, things get quite interesting because you can work out, for example, how much rain would fall in that catchment. And by knowing how much rain's in the catchment, you can get ideas on things like dilution of dye. You can try. You can get a bit more of an understanding about the characteristics of water going through those caves. So, for example, at Marble Arch, most of the catchment is in a sandstone area, and it all runs off. So, very large catchment going into the cave system, and that's why Marble Arch has got such a, a large discharge volume during during high flow because it's a very large that's what catching going into the conduit system. Other caves like Cascades Prods, 
even though they have not been connected to Marble Arch, have a very different flood response. They have very different dilution points dilution and um, responses from dye recovery as well. So like I mentioned before, with Marble Arch, you typically get a, a slug of dye coming through after you've injected it and it hasn't diluted much. But in prods cascades, the catchment is much, it's quite longer and this is all catchment. The whole catchment is limestone. So you've got a lot more underground flow paths to get the resurgence. So you get the dye dispersing a bit more. And Certainly in the tracer test we've done at Frog's Cascades, when the dye comes out, it comes out for a, a couple of days rather than just a couple of hours like a marble arch. So on to a bit of a, a case study. Um, I'm just going to put some cascades here because I think it's one of the most interesting uh, caves in the Fermana area in terms of its hydrology and its hydrogeology. Interesting, this is a photograph that was taken about 20 years ago when Cascades was a water source. Um, it's probably not the best water source that we've had in the Northern Ireland, in, in the Fermanagh area. Um, I mean, traditionally, springs would be considered to be a, a quite a high quality water source for in the local areas. But I think for anybody that's been into Cascades and been caving to the end there, there's an awful lot of mud in the stream passage. Whenever the cave floods, a lot of that gets washed away. Um, and it also links into a, a lot of um, agricultural land upon the mile bank, um, quite close to silage and, and, and uh, the rest of it. So um, it's no longer used as a water source because of incidents in the cave and in the area over the years. But it was a, it was a source of water for a very long time. Right. So just to zoom in at Marble Arch Cascades, um, we really need to update this and get that connection in so that we can show how the cave discoveries have advanced the surveys in the area. But just to focus in on, on this area of Cascades, I mean, most uh, folks that have been at the Cascades will know that when you go through the entrance series and you go into the mainstream passage, there are very few inlets in the cascade section of the cave. There's quite a lot of high havens, and yes, they do activate when it's raining, but it really, you really have to go to the upstream end of prods before you get into these inlets that are coming in. And all of these inlets have, are fed from sinking water. Uh, surface streams are sinking into the cave. Um, if you've been up to Cascade Inlet, you get up to the, the sumps at the end there, and they're pretty close to the surface. And it's very clear that the water sinking in the surface is getting into those and the water's coming through very quickly. Equally at Formation Passage, there's been positive traces coming in from the, the Owen Breen River. And that's fed from there. Um, Papers Passage is a little bit different. There are a small number of strings, springs around, a small number of stream sinks around the area. But for those of you that have been in there, there's some quite big passage. The uh, passage is very large for the size of water going through there at the moment. Looking a bit more about the trace tests that have been proven in the area, just going to focus on a couple here. Um, and you may have noticed that in John Gunn's original catchment divide, he had a, a catchment divide between prods, cascades, and marble arch. His subsequent work showed that actually the Owen Brew River loses quite a lot of water along its length. And in fact, the Owen Breen River does feed into Formation Passage. And that's both the, the lower sinks in the Owen Breen and the upper sinks in the Owen Breen as well. And this is quite interesting because some of these sinks up here, they're in the, uh, they're in the limestone, they're in the, the shales above the limestone. So there's some really interesting work you do in that area. And for those of you that know the Owen Breen, I think it's one of, the, my, it's one of my favorite parts of, of Colton because if you go there, and it hasn't been raining. This is the Owen Broom River. And it's it's a big river, but it's bone dry when it doesn't have much rainfall. And I think this is probably looks like it's winter as well, so it's probably done with every. But when it's in a flood, there's an awful lot of water comes down here. So this is the same bend in the river here. So big contrast there. So when the water um, overtops some of the sinks in the upper, the water flows down the river and all the way down to Polisuma. 
But although the water goes down to Polysumer and through to Marble Arch, the river is losing flow in its base all the way along, and that's going to Cascades. There's a real complicated relationship between the water going to Marble Arch and the water going to Cascades. And we used trace tests to work out exactly what was going on there. And we came up with this schematic of how water in the river is being lost into the, the upper sinks and it's flowing along the formation passage. But we also found that in places it was resurging again and going on down to Polisuma. So there was quite a complicated relationship here. And interestingly, because of one, the upper stream is going to Polisuma and the lower one is going to formation passage and cascade. So the catchment effectively feeds two springs. Looking at that table I had prepared of it earlier on, and just to highlight cascades. Like I said, these these, sink, these sinking streams here are all in the East Coker area, and they're quite a long way from cascades. But there are an awful lot of these stream sinks that drain to cascades, and they drain through pretty quickly as well. So cascades isn't just fed by that local set of stream sinks, it's fed by sinks that are further away. And it's because of these results we started doing a lot more work in the, in the East Coker area. And in particular, I'm sure from previous presentations I've talked about pigeon pots and badger. Um, but there's a very interesting dynamic going on in the East Coker area where we have water going in multiple directions. And this was proven by tracer tests and it was proven by putting dye in a pigeon pot and then monitoring the springs around the edge of the escarpment here. Springs all the way along the edge of the northern part of the escarpment, so Tullyhona, Cascades, Marble Arch, and then over at Shannon as well. So there was an awful lot of samples taken to get those results and prove connections. As I mentioned earlier on, um, the technology is really advanced in water tracing, especially in the last 10 years. We now have uh, portable fluorometers, so we're no longer analyzing for fluorescence in a laboratory. We have portable fluorometers that can sit in the screen and take a sample at whatever frequency you want. And because of that, the, the process has largely been automated. Um, when I was doing my research, like I said, I was spending weeks driving around taking samples from streams and springs. Um, spent many, many days taking water samples. But now we can put these instruments into the resurgences, set them up, and they will analyze the water continuously for usually the batteries last for three or four weeks. So this is the results of one we did in Cascades back in 2017. So the dye went in on August the 5th. Um, this is the background. There's always a bit of background for residents because of the two fogs. But we got this very clear positive breakthrough curve on the dye. And this was a single clean breakthrough curve as well. On doing the analyses on the quantity of dye that came through, and in this particular case, we did do quite a lot of dye in, we worked out that about 60% of the dye that went into pigeon pot came out here. And based on that, we you know that 40% of the dye came out elsewhere. Um, the other big positive was obviously at Shannon Pot, um, so we know that's where the dye goes to otherwise, but it'll be interesting to repeat these tests in different flow conditions to find out if that dynamic changes. But from this, it seems to be the case that the, the main flow path from Pigeon is to Cascade. Um, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, there's an awful lot of unknown cave passes between those two comes into formation passage of Cog Pot and it comes through very quickly. Possibly quite large passage. Okay, I'm going to move on to this catchment care now, which is the new program that I'm involved with in with John Kelly. Um, it's funded by the EU and SUI applied for the funding with myself and John Kelly pulling all the application together and designing the program. Uh, we put the application in November last year and we found out in March of 2020 that we were successful. 
and we took receipt of a very large quantity of dye a few months ago. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we haven't been able to start, but as said previously, we're not really in the, uh, the trade test season at the moment. So we are building up to quite a lot of water tracing in the autumn, winter, spring, going forward to 2020, 21 and 2022. The program is focusing on border areas. So in this case, we're focusing on the, the Arnie River and the Arnie is the river that the, that the, the, the Cladda Glen feeds into. So it's the water from McKinney, with the upper and lower McKinney. Um, for those of you that have been in the likes of White Fathers, um, Holland Gossam, those caves are very close to the border area and those are the focus of what we're going to be looking at. So there's a program being designed now and we're going to be looking at a lot of the sinks that are in the area of the Burren, between Burren Forest and Cavern, down to Shannon Cave, Shannon Pot area. Um, it's the last area in the Cocoa Mountain area where we don't have a really definitive handle on the catching delineations. So it's still very unclear which sinks go to Shannon Pot, which caves go to Baron Rising, which is the main rising for Holland and Gotham. So it's an area that there's still a lot of questions. And with this application, we will be carrying out that work. Um, the funding for the project has covered the cost of two automatic loggers. Um, and we've got these up and running now. So we're effectively gearing up to start this work this autumn and we're going to need some help. So part of the reason of this talk is to tell the local cavers and cavers across Ireland North and South that John and I are carrying out this project and we would absolutely love it if anybody who's keen to get involved got in touch because we are probably going to be doing of the order of 30 to 40 die traces over the next three years and that's going to include trace tests where dye is going to be injected in cave. So, for example, downstream end of Shannon, we'll be looking to put some dye in there and see how long it takes to come out of Shannon Pot. Um, but also, I know there's been lots of discoveries in the Cavern Burren area recently, and we'll be keen to find out where they drain to. Do they drain to the Shannon? Do they drain to the urn? So we're expecting a lot of good work to be done in the next three years. Um, the results are going to be shared between the Environment Protection Agency in the Republic, NIEA in the North, and Geology Surveys North and South as well. And there'll be presentations at symposiums in the future, as well as probably quite a few papers coming out of this as well. So it's all very exciting work. But I think John and I are realizing so yeah, that uh, we really need help on this one. So like I said, if anybody's interested, give us a chance. Um, we haven't been sitting on our hands during COVID times. We've been doing a lot of work, getting ready. So we've developed a, a workflow, which has been shared with the environment agencies about how we're going to go about doing this. And we're pulling together a list of sinks that we want to do the trace tests in. Um, same for the resurgence as well. Uh, the Geology Survey of Ireland are being very kind in supporting us as well, and there's going to be some water level instrumentation going to be installed across the region as well. So hopefully we'll get a really good handle on how the caves in the area respond to flood forces as well as dye coming out. And with that, we'll be able to build a really good conceptual model about how that dye is moving through the system. And we can take into account the likes of dilution, which I mentioned before. We can tag in the rainfall and see how long it takes for water levels to start rising in caves and that kind of thing. So I think there's going to be an awful lot of data from this. And it's going to be really advancing our understanding of, of the cast in the, in the Coker area. All right. Yes, that's just a picture of the loggers. And just to prove to you that the loggers have actually arrived, so I've been talking about them for over a year, we have, uh, we have the loggers, which are quite bulky instruments, but 
for those of you that have helped me out with die tracing in the past, you'll have noticed that the loggers that we were using back then were probably about 25, 30 kilos in weight. And um, didn't get too many volunteers when we were talking about putting them into the state passage in Shadow. I certainly didn't want to carry them in. But these new loggers, they weigh about six kilos. Um, they are much more mobile. So we'll be using, we'll be deploying these in caves as well. Um, they're very robust pieces of kit, waterproof 200 meters. Um, um, I think we're going to get some quite interesting tracer tests on them over the next three years. So I think that's pretty much But if anybody does have any questions or anything, do shout out because uh, hopefully, hopefully people have been interested in what we've been talking about. Okay. My God, thank you so much for the presentation. It was so interesting. <laughs> I mean, when when is sent when is sent over the presentation to me, I I always take a look just to make sure as well, like if something if something happened, like we can have a backup or something, then I can jump in. But then I was just starting going through. I was like, oh my god, this is amazing, and it was. <laughs> so thank you so much for the presentation. And um, I'm I'm just wondering, like when you were preparing to go to the field and to collect some samples, what what is the the most challenging part? You know, like besides the 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 sample organization where you need to go first and second like besides this part on uh, which, which part is the most challenging like when once because once you're in the field i i know it depends on the area that you are it takes uh more time to go through the the color in the river the stream and i i don't know i was i was just wondering like how, how much time you need to wait to to this to happen or um, how how these how this works in the field for you? Biggest challenge is always the Irish weather. No, <laughs> always. <laughs> always. Um, the number of times we've got a forecast, you know, forecasts are pretty good these days. But you know, there's a storm front coming in, and you know that storm front is probably going to flush the day out the system. And uh, the number of times we've been out and just difficulty getting to the loggers to download them because the water levels have risen so much. Um, being called out at silly times to go and fetch things and recover things, but it's always the weather. You just don't know when the tide's going to come out. It really depends on the weather. I, I, um, oh, <laughs> one thing with, with I, I thought you were going to say it's thought? the Irish cavers, just too much faffing. <laughs> I wouldn't know what you're talking about, Paul. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's actually, I mean, a lot of this work simply wouldn't have been done with uh, without papers. Um, when I was doing the PhD in the mid 90s, um, there was always a load of people that were really keen to find, you know, to come and give me a hand with stuff um, because we were doing trace tests in caves as well. There was there was always people keen to uh, help out. And uh, for those of you that haven't seen the PhD, there's a long list of acknowledgements at the start just because of all the, all the help we get. So there's never been a shortage of help. But uh, yeah, the, the, the weather's always been a problem. We used to be sitting in Frank Eddy's and we'd, um, we'd be waiting to see what the weather was doing. And some people, some of the team would put a they put a pint glass outside and we'd go and check it every hour to see how much rain had actually come oh, Jesus. Yeah, we a, a bit more high tech these days with our apps. but. Um, yeah, it's keeping a handle on the weather because quite often, as soon as that flood force comes, it flushes the die out. And getting your sampling so that you're taking the most frequent samples as the die is coming out is always going to give you the highest resolution data. But with these loggers, that's that's largely superfluous now. Um, we can get really good data and download it after two or three weeks, and it's it's really good. It really has revolutionised. The, the amount of work you can do. Um, one thing I didn't mention about those loggers is you can be so, as part of the project, we don't just have fluorescene, we've actually got three dyes and we can put a, a, a dye into a different sink at the same time and keep on recording. So we can do three traces in one go, which is a real bonus as well. So, uh, that's just quite good. 
That's really interesting. How how it would work? Like uh, you were talking about channel pot, and how how it would work there? You would would put like one in a pot, and then one in the stream, in the cave, or for the tracing at Shannon Pot. Um, yeah, we're we're really interested how long it takes the water to come out of Shannon Pot, but also travel through the cave. So, for example, we're proposing to do a tracer test, another one from Pigeon to Shannon, but one of the uh, portable perimeters will be put into Mistake Passage, and we'll get the time when it comes into Mistake Passage, and we we'll get a time when it comes out at the other end of Shannon Pot. So we'll be able to determine flow rates through the two sections, through the, the unknown section from Pigeon to Shannon Cave, and then from Shannon Cave to the Shannon Pot. So, yeah. And we're going to have to be very careful with how we um, install these devices. Um, they're, they're not cheap, but mildly. Um, so at the moment, we're designing some housing so that we can install them securely and safely and make sure, for example, we're not washed away because we've all know, we all know what the water levels are around, like around here. And the last thing we want to do is have these devices washed away by one of the flood courses that we're trying to measure the dye coming out of. There's a lot of work going on at the moment. We're yeah. talking to the landowners and we're talking to Cavan County Council and Manor District Council, so that they're all aware of what's going on. And uh, they're, all, they're all supportive and all keen, so yeah. Yeah, and we we have one question here from PD, and um, he's asking, Les, can you explain how the water loggers function? Yeah, effectively, the dyes that we put in, they change the fluorescence of the water. So what the light, what the loggers do is they shine a UV light at a certain emission and they record where the dye is detected in that light. So if I bring the device and hold it up to the screen, maybe this will work, you'll see it's got, got three little eyes. Oops. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, nice. Yeah, you can see that, yeah. Yeah. Got three eyes. Each eye is set to the frequency of a particular dye. Oh. And so you program them. And they work the same as a, a laboratory perimeter. And laboratory perimeters are huge and bulky, and they can do a phenomenal amount of, of, of but essentially what it's doing is it's measuring the fluorescence at a certain frequency of the water, and that frequency is specific to certain dye. So it shines the light every 15 minutes, it records in fluorescence, it logs it. But it's the, the resolution that they can record it to is phenomenal. So these loggers can record essentially it's it's one part of the billion. So if the dye is in the water, they will they will log it. The same resolution as the They're very robust and they come with very large batteries. Yeah. And quite large memory chips. So they're they're, they're, they're pretty much lovely. But this one now is it's at least lighter than the other, yeah. Yes, the, the 25 kilogram perimeters were particularly hard work. They were also quite fragile as well. Um, and a number of times when you've been dragging it to, through the cave to get to the point and you open it up and you realize that cable's been squished or an end cap's come off and water's got in and you have to take it back out again. But the beauty of these ones is that they're fully submersible. They're actually designed to be um, put in boreholes um, with 200 mm. meters deep. So they. Um, they're, they're particularly robust. And, uh, yeah. So. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, and basically SUI has used them for the next three or four years. Oh. After that, they will go back to the geology server. Um, but we have use of them for this project um, until the die runs out, basically. And like I said, we we, we a lot of plans to use it. We we have we have one one uh, actually two more questions here. Um, Tom is asking, um, I may have missed it uh, since I got there late. Um, but did you use other kinds of tracers, biological, isotopic, or hydrochemistry? Yeah, um, I have used hydrochemistry um, on a number of projects myself, um, and that effectively is doing some water quality analyses of the springs and resurgences and finding out which ones have the same chemistry because quite often they can vary. But 
in Irish cast, there tends to be very little variance in the, the, the native water quality. So certain parts of the world, you can use hydrochemistry, but in, in Irish cast, that tends not to be the case. Um, interestingly, Shannon Pot is one where we were able to use uh, hydrochemistry because there's some quite strange elements coming out of it, naturally, um, but other things, no. Um, in Irish setting, the other main trace that's been used is coloured spores, and this is effectively having coloured spores released at particular um, stream sinks, and then collecting the spores in nets at resurgences and finding out which ones which ones come through. Um, a lot of the work that Dave Drew did was using spores. He did a lot of that work in the 90s and early noughties, and he got some really good results. Um, that's very expensive work. Um, you do need to then look under, I think you have to look under a microscope to work out which colours have been, been present. Um, I'm a big fan of the fluorescent dyes, um, simply because it's a, it's a really well, well proven technology. And it's quite a cheap technology as well, which is why it's been new pages worldwide, really. Fluorescent has probably been most common tracer that's been used in past hydrogeology. For those of you that uh, have looked at the, the Slovenia Caves and Cars group, you'll notice the, the, the front cover on that is the lime green stream coming out of the <coughs> Slovenia Caves and Cars group. Yeah, it's good. It's really interesting as well. I was trying to remember which one on I got I got the chance to watch a presentation of hydrology in Grinha, uh, it's north in Italy. I believe they were using the biological one and exotic, but I, I don't I, I don't I, I didn't know by the time like what was the difference properly. I mean now now I understand more. <laughs> Thanks for you. <laughs> but I remember they, they were trying to trust the um, the mountain range and see see how it was going down. And, but yeah, I did like I didn't know the difference. Now, now we're just having a click inside of my head. <laughs> the, the benefit of using the 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 the, um, the the scores effectively is that you can use a lot of colours. So you can use I think they've got up to ten or fifteen. But you can use a lot, so you can get a lot done in a single trace. But it's really only for big academic projects or big big private projects. So it's, it's, the, it's the way of getting a lot of results in a short period of time, but it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. And then um, uh, there is there is one more question here. Oh, Tom, Tom is, is thinking. Okay, yeah. Say again, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Okay, so uh, there is one, one question here, it's Helen. Um, how do you work out where to look for the dyes after they leave the cave? Um, yeah, that, that's all. Like she's saying, like, sorry, I'm completely clueless on these, but it's like there is no no weird question. You can just do the question here. That's oh, okay. Right. <laughs> no, that, that's actually a really good question. Um, See? <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, when, when John Gunn started doing his tracer tests in the Coca area, he started putting dye into springs, into, sorry, putting dye into stream sinks and just detecting it, a small number of springs that were nearby. Um, because he didn't know where the dye was going to come out, so he covered those springs that were locally. And it was only when he started putting detectors, and these are the old-fashioned charcoal detectors, of springs in the entire area, did he realize that it can, in some cases, it can come out nearly anywhere. So when you're doing your initial chase tests, you have to cover a lot of springs. And you can only do that usually with charcoal detectors. But when you know where the dye comes out, then you can bring in the loggers and the, the, the high resolution instrumentation and get your really good data set so you can do the analysis. So it's a, it's, a, it's a twofold step really. It's work out where the dye comes out and then you do your detailed analysis. But if I was looking at a new area and you're putting water in, putting dye into a, a stream sink, you would have to put detectors up all of the resurgences because you do not know where that water is going to come in. And it always surprises you. That's really interesting. That was a really good question, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. Just, just uh, 
thinking back to your student student days, um, Liz, uh, how did you get involved in the whole sort of hydro hydrogeology and, and, and what sparked your interest into it all? Oh, well, interest in geology came from uh, when I was a kid, my folks emigrated to South Africa and my dad worked in a gold mine and he was always bringing me rock samples back, which I thought was great. He was telling me it was gold, and it, of course, it was gold. Um, but yeah, it, it's, well, I went to college and it was in London and uh, most of the people in the Cavan Club were geologists. So it was basically... Yeah, geology Monday to Friday, and then and then caving weekends. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've I think we've all been you know we've all been drawn to caving by by their very different ways. But it is such an unusual environment, such a unique environment, and it's so easy to get pooped. And uh, I really was keen to find out where that water was going to and where it was coming from. So ended up being my career. Cool. Yeah. It it sounds it sounds like most uh, the groups that I was uh, together in Brazil like most most of the groups they were not sometimes from the university sometimes they were not but then there was like ecologists geologists and people from geography or biology and that's all and then when you go to the field and you just breathe this like you just have this the entire week and then your academic year is about that as well and then you go caving and then it's like you just live like that for a couple of years together <laughs> having this balance between the academic side and then the, the, the Spartish side I, I don't I don't really think I don't really like to think that it, it, it's paleology is a sport really because there's more understanding about the environment when you were in the field and it, it brings you to the mind like, okay, how did it happen? Like, why, why the, the flow of this cave is like that? Or why that fracture exists there? And then it just brings to your mind like loads of questions. And then you just go to run to see if you can find something. And then you just run, run back and say, okay, now I can understand more or less why that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm I'm still looking forward to getting some like, level data from some of these caves because, you know, yeah, I mean, it's been a while since I was, was caving in this part of the world. Um, also, they'll be caving to the other for a while. But uh, you know, you'd be caving and you'd see water levels starting to rise and you'd think, well, why on earth is that starting to happen now? So I think there's still an awful lot to learn about how the caves are responding. And I think as, as a, cavers in general, I think having that information about knowing Knowing how caves respond to the floodwaters and knowing how caves um, can respond is is it's really handy to have basically. Especially yeah, this part of the world where it rains. That leads me on to sort of an interesting second part to this question: is um, a lot of cavers will always be told to you know check the weather forecast before they go underground, but not a lot of cavers know exactly what they're looking for. Um, you know, they might look at precipitation, but they, they don't really have a good understanding of how a cave reacts to that increase in water level through precipitation over a length of time. So what would you recommend to cavers, particularly in Ireland, to be looking for um, uh, about that sort of scenario or situation when they choose to go caving on maybe a, a horrible weekend? <laughs> Let's talk to the local cavers. The local cavers know how caves respond. Um, for example, in the Fermanagh area, if you're talking to people what to do when it's it's raining lots, there are a small number of caves that you can do, but they would also maybe flag that there are a small number of caves that you need to be particularly wary of. And the, the classic one is, is bow caves because bow has a quite a significant lag time before it starts to flood and it doesn't flood as in a flood post coming through the cave passages, it effectively floods upwards. Um, so in bow caves, it's not uncommon to have water levels rising 12 or 24 hours after the rain has mm -hmm. stopped. But if you, for those of you, and take Paul the Gollum of the Boats as an example, Paul the Gollum of the Boats responds so quickly, there have been quite a few caving clubs that remain <laughs> unnamed who have been caught out because they were in the cave and they were in the cave perhaps only for two or three hours. But that was enough for the you Owen know, River to respond and to rapidly through flow through the cave from Polisumera and uh, sump off 
that firstly. So there there are caves which you have to be particularly wary of, um, but the local cavers are well aware how um, how caves react and which caves to avoid. So, yeah, check locals. Yeah, it's really important. Just to avoid some some um, horrible situations in the future, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, I think most cavers I know have been trapped in a cave for some length of time. So. Oh my God! Yeah, especially when we start hearing like the flush come in, like the shh, oh. and then it just starts running. Oh, the Jesus. dread. <laughs> yeah, but but it's. I, I think one of the big technologies that's advanced over the last few years is just simply the weather app. And, you know, no longer are we just getting a, a big cloud over an area with raindrops <laughs> saying it'll rain tomorrow. Um, we're not getting forecasts on an hourly basis. And when you start seeing the rainfall going up to, you know, one millimeters in half an hour or eight millimeters in an hour or 20 millimeters in an hour, yeah, those are not the times to go caving. So I am a, a strong believer in getting a good forecast. And I think yeah, the weather apps are the are the best thing around at the moment. They give you a, give you a pretty accurate forecast of what's coming. But of course, if you're coming down to Samana for a weekend or Claire for a weekend, it's always good. I like to chat to little cavers because they'll tell you what the weather's been like for that week. And if water levels are already high and it rains again, then it's definitely going to cause a problem. Water levels been low for a while, then in cases you may not notice water level rising at all. So. There's a question coming here. So, is there a good time to go on a caving holiday in Ireland? It's like don't 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 plan too much yourself. Just just you know come come. Uh, Having your mind that place might be changed uh, in some moment. I, I, I'm going to slightly yeah. twist that question a bit and say, is is there a time to go on a caving holiday away from <laughs> Ireland? <laughs> um, yeah, um, and for those of you that were. So I gave a presentation at the symposium, it must be 20 years ago, and I, I presented <laughs> rainfall data, and I, I showed when was the, the wettest weekend of the year, and the the, the correlation with the symposium was, was basically quite scary. So <laughs> the symposium is usually the wettest weekend of the year. Um, so s stay in the hotel. S surprisingly dry last year, <laughs> which is always good. Yeah, uh, there's been a few dry ones, but uh, there's been a few super soggy ones as well. Yeah, I mean, caving in Ireland in the summer is 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 you can go way forward. Um, you just have to be wary because when you get those big thunderstorms, sometimes rolling in, um, yeah. they can they can dump a lot of rainfall in a very short period of time. So, yeah. I mean, during during April, the first month of the lockdown, the weather was amazing and super dry, and we were just locked down. And you know. And yeah, it always seems our student caving forums a fantastic <laughs> weekend, and then it's always beautifully dry, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. Easter for you. First week in go caving was just flashing rain all the time. <laughs> That's all right. Life goes. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a big discussion going on in Ireland at the moment in terms of climate change because a lot of the uh, the forecasts for for rainfall are saying we are going to get heavier showers, more intense. You know, it's not. It's no longer the the really soft rain that uh, Ireland used to be famous for. We are getting a lot more. The intensity is. is the indications are that the intensity is, is getting greater. So, yeah, climate change is affecting is affecting Ireland. And uh, certainly, when I'm doing work in Ireland, the when you do your predictions for designing systems for taking rainfall, we're using larger and larger volumes simply because we have to take climate change into account. So, do you, do you think then, in the long term, that all and, and, and what sort of time frame then would you say that climate change would have an impact on cavers being able to access certain caves? Uh, I don't think it'll be an issue for access to caves. I just think it'll be changing the characteristics of how floodwaters respond purely because intensity is increasing. And I'd say that it's probably been noticed in certainly the time I've been caving in Ireland. So it's probably been there 20, 25 years. It's been a little, a little, a little. But who knows where we're going to be. Um, yeah. It, it might just be my memory because I remember when I first started caving in Fermanagh, which would be about 1994, it was just always very soft rain. But every time, you know, I'm up here at the moment, it's, it's, it's just quite a lot of heavy showers. So, um, yeah, I think there's certainly the data saying that has changed. We've had, I think, three of the 
three of the wettest years in the last the last ten, and the floods we had in 2009, and the floods we had, I should get the dates here, 2015. Both of those floods, uh, these are floods in the sort of the Galway area, the west area. Both of those floods were classified by Met Airing as being floods that would normally have a return period of about 200 years. So oh, wow. We got two of them in 67, yeah. But of course, the fact that it's, you know, let's say a return period of 200 years doesn't mean it's going to happen every 200 years. It just means that there's a very low likelihood of them occurring. Um, oh. but, but yeah, the numbers are certainly indicating more intensity. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's, there's no more questions coming in anyway, so. No. <laughs> awesome. Very good. That, thank you so much, Les. Thank you so much. It was so interesting, it was a really. really. Good talk. And thank you for accepting and to, you know, build the entire presentation and come here. Yeah, no, it was a it was a fantastic presentation, Les. It really gives you good insight into the 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 workings of um, hydrology within a cave environment. Um, it really opens your eyes up to the to the other world and the other side of things. Um, you know, normally for me, it's just really in the last year or so, I've got really interested and involved with the whole exploration side of caving. Um, it used to be just sport caving for myself, where I'd run in and 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 say, "Oh, I've done that cave," but. But now it's it's really interesting to see both the side of you know how a cave reacts under certain weather conditions uh, and how it's not just the cave itself causing that but the area around it the sort of envelope ties in very nicely with my level geography which is which is good um, so yeah no great great talk Les thanks very much yeah. um, thank you very yeah, much we'll, we'll be putting updates on the tracer tests on the SUI webpage and various other social media so. Which will keep everybody in the loop about what's going on. And like I said, if anybody does want to give us a hand, please get them. Um, just want. I'm gonna just leave my name here. <laughs> I'm just just gonna put here. <laughs> I also want to just shout out that the SUI's EGM is going to take place next m Monday the seventeenth at seven p.m. Just a wee reminder to all of our members. Good, 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 good. All right, so uh, thank you everyone who is watching until now, and thank you for everyone that is, is, is being with us like during the presentation and during the, the questions as well. You are always uh, really helpful, and I mean, we are doing this to show to people as well, so without you, we wouldn't be anything as well. So thank you so much for being here, thank you Les for accepting the invite, and thank you Paul for making this possible. No problem at all. And I, I believe I'll see you all soon. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't actually, uh, we were planning to do this um, fortnightly, but then um, we are just finding more people to join us and do the live stream and then see, I, we, don't, we don't actually have a time, a time or a date to, to do the next one, but we will let you know through the social medias and, you know, technologies in general. <laughs> it's, it's hard to get people together who want to do it now that other most countries are coming out of their lockdown. Um, it, it, it's very yeah. difficult, but hopefully we'll be able to get a couple more over the next few months. Um, but, we'll, exactly. but we'll let you know when they're happening. We won't say bye. <laughs> we just say see you soon. <laughs> and uh, yeah, all right. all right. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.